hello, good evening, very warm welcome to you to this evening's service at Grace Community Church here online. Uh, I'm Simon and I'll be guiding you through uh, the next little while as we share the second in our series of interviews, Real Lives. We've called these summer evening services and we're connecting with brothers and sisters from the wider church, people who are not regularly part of our church but have uh, willingly given up a bit of time to be interviewed over Zoom. Uh, to share a little a little bit about their life story and what God has done in them and through them and uh, we're, we're really delighted to be able to uh, bring this series to you. Uh, this evening we're going to be introducing Baroness Caroline Cox in a moment or two uh, but before we do that uh, let me read to you from scripture. I'm going to read to you from the Bible from Galatians chapter 6. So if you have a Bible handy there at home <clears throat> why don't you grab it and we'll begin at verse 1 in Galatians 6. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfil the law of Christ. If anyone thinks there's something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Uh, this is God's word to us this evening. And I was struck in reading that and uh, thinking about this evening that our guest, uh, Caroline Cox, Baroness Cox, is somebody who's lived out uh, really clearly those last two verses that we read together. Even as most of us would be contemplating retirement and retiring from uh, whatever it is we've been doing, she's as busy as ever not growing weary in doing good. And as she has the opportunity and more than, she does good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And we'll hear a bit about that in the interview in a moment or two's time. It's a couple of weeks ago now since I had the privilege of sitting down and uh, chatting to Caroline Cox. Um, she's well known as being a member of the House of Lords. Uh, she was a deputy speaker in the House of Lords uh, for some time. But she's also the founder and CEO of a charity called HEART, the Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust. Caroline is someone who's taken the position that she's been given uh, in this life as a baroness and used it not to her own advantage, but to speak up for those who have no voice for themselves. Now, sadly, the internet connection between my study here and her study in Whitney in Oxfordshire on the afternoon that we spoke wasn't the greatest. And so you'll need to concentrate a little bit at times, but uh, we're excited to be able to share and hear about uh, how Caroline became a Baroness in the first place and then how she's used that position to benefit other people and to speak up for people, not just here in the UK, but around the world. She's been involved in the UK in uh, enacting legislation uh, around freedom of speech a few years ago. Some of you will remember uh, when that unlikely alliance of uh, Christian leaders and comedians, Rowan Atkinson was involved in that, uh, Baroness Cox was key in getting some of that legislation on the statute book. And she's particularly now concerned here in the UK with the plight of women who are uh, caught up in the oppression of forced marriages under Sharia law in the Muslim community. Overseas, her work with Heart has taken her to some of the most dangerous places on the planet. And she's been closely involved with some of those major flashpoints around the globe. So this is our interview with Caroline Cox. Well, Baroness Cox, it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome you to uh, Grace Community Church, uh, virtually, our virtual service. Um, we're so thankful for you um, being willing to speak to us and just to share with us uh, something of your life and uh, current experience. And we are incredibly grateful to you. Um, whereabouts are you? currently sitting because you're not able to sit in the Lord's physically at the moment. Where, where am I speaking to you? First, may I thank you for the great privilege of being with Grace Community Church. Huge privilege. I wish I could see you all, but lovely mm. to be with you in spirit. And I'm currently working 
from my home, uh, people can go to the Lords, but they discourage you because only have very few people in the chamber and say rather you work from home and you can do it all by Zoom. So right. I, I home in Whitney in Oxfordshire. Oh, lovely. Nice part of the world to be, uh, to be isolating, I suppose, but uh, that's super. Um, I, I sort of been struggling with this next one it is how do I address a baroness? I don't think I, if I'm honest, ever met um, a, a real life baroness before and I, I feel privileged to be able to do so. Um, but should I refer to you as uh, your grace, your highness, milady, your majesty, what, what should I, how should I refer to you? Well, if you want to be really formal and you can do it once and once is more than enough, the formal title is Baroness Cox. Uh, there's an informal title of your social events, that kind of thing, is Lady Cox. My Christian name is Caroline, so we'll stay with Caroline if you don't mind. Well, Baroness Cox, that's very kind of you. I will refer to you as Caroline from, from here on, if that's okay with you. That's very kind of you. I'm so, sure. what is a Baroness? How does one become a Baroness? Well, when I introduce myself, I always say I'm actually a nurse and a social scientist by intention, as I thought I was doing in my life, and a baroness by astonishment. Wasn't in politics, <laughs> don't like politics, and so much not in that world, I was the first baroness I'd ever met. It's quite a shock, you wake up one morning and find a baroness looking at herself out of the bathroom mirror. But of course, what a privilege. <clears throat> so I asked God how I could use this privilege for speaking in Parliament, and the idea came very clearly that it's a wonderful place to be a voice for those who do not have a voice, or people who have voices whose voices are not heard. That's how I <laughs> my role in the House of Lords. And that applies to uh, humanitarian work for victims of oppression and persecution, not reached by the aid organisations for political reasons or security reasons, but also for work I do with Muslim women in this country who suffer in many communities from the application of Sharia law. So there's a home front and there's a foreign weighty. Yeah, yeah. And that's very much given you that um, public platform, I suppose, and enabled you to be that advocate and that voice. Yeah. Yeah. It is a great privilege, and I think it does really make a difference. And because mm. in one of the ways of fulfilling that mandate was I set up my initial charity, Heart Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust, uh, to reach people suffering oppression and persecution, not reached by the aid organisations, either for security reasons, because it's high risk, and if you've got um, people in your team for whom you're responsible, then of course you wouldn't send them to work in active conflict zones. Um, or um, that we work for local partners and they're the real heroes and heroines and they're indigenous so they're there anyway. It may be risky visiting them but they're on those front lines of faith and freedom and uh, they are there. And the other reason why people don't go is for political reasons because the big boys can only go with permission of a sovereign government. The sovereign right. government has permission, they don't go. We do spend quite a bit of our time crossing borders illegally, quite shamelessly, to be with the unreached and the unheard. I'd love to spend most of our time there in a moment, um, but if I may, just um, what would, did life look like for you before you started this particular role in, and before you became a Baroness? How was, how was it, was it very different? Well, just very, very briefly, um, as I said, I, I, up, I was a nurse, first of all. I qualified at the London Hospital in the East End of London. I worked as a staff nurse, then I had the best nursing education anyone can ever have which was six months as a patient, and you'd be much with tuberculosis of the kidney. And I'd been a much nicer nurse, but I'd had that experience before I touched a patient. And then that knocked me out of clinical nursing, so I did my degrees in social sciences, because I wanted to um, reframe, as it were, the way doctors and nurses looked at patients. In those days, long before you were born, but they really were diagnoses. People talked about the coronary in the fourth bed on the left. And I really wanted to enhance uh, the nursing and medical professions and seeing patients as people with their own cultures, their own backgrounds, their own families, and so on and so forth. So I wrote a couple of textbooks, one for, by like, joint edited, a textbook for medical students, and I wrote my own textbook on sociology for nurses, midwives, and health visitors. And then um, I found myself, for some strange and different reason, uh, going into the academic world of sociology. Right. And um, I found myself as head of the department Polytechnic of North London, as it then was, and that was a real political shock. Um, it was the days of massive far left, I mean, I mean extremist far left, Marxist 
infiltration in many areas of higher education, I chaired um, or headed a department of 16 of the 20 academic staff of the Communist Party or further left. Their definition of higher education was not mine, mine's freedom to pursue the truth within the canons of academic rigor. And theirs was really hardline academic blackmail, physical violence, uh, appalling maltreatment of students. And um, I just couldn't tolerate it. So I fought it for nine years, it was tough. And then eventually, because I knew it wasn't only happening in Polytechnic of North London, I knew it was happening in the kind of soft underbelly of higher education up and down the country. So with two colleagues who didn't come from the so a hot spot of sociology, you wrote a book called The Rape of Reason, The Corruption of Project in the North London, just documenting all of this and its implications. And you don't write and run. So I was going back to face the music quite nervous. And then God sent a, a light me. The day before the book was due to be published, I was phoned up, maybe before your day, by someone called Bernard Levin, who was a very well-respected uh, writer in the Times. And uh, he said, I just made a book. I think it's the most important book for the future of democracy. I get my article tomorrow to cover it. So that was God's Lifeline. The day the book came out, there was a wonderful uh, centerpiece on the middle of all the times. In all its brutality, the making of an intellectual concentration. And at the end, he said, I think this is such an important book. I'm going to devote my remaining two articles this week to discussing it. So right. he gave a trilogy, which only done before for Mozart and Solzhenitsyn. and it's a really good company. But that, yeah, I, absolutely. Into the House of Lords as an academic freedom fighter. Right. So as a result of that publication, then that that set you on your your current path. That's right. So for you, um, you make no bones about being a Christian believer as well. Um, where in, in in your life sort of journey did faith begin to play a significant part for you? I was very fortunate to be brought up in a Christian family, so it was there all the time. I was yeah. at the age of eleven long time ago, and um, I still remember my confirmation text to this day, Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you, be strong, and with courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed by the Lord your God and with you wherever you go. I am often afraid, I am often dismayed, but it was a very good confirmation text. And so I've been brought up in the faith, but it has ups and downs and doubts, of course, but I've been privileged to be a Christian since being tiny. Oh, that's lovely, that's lovely. Um, so that, that change in, in life's emphasis and change of direction for you has, has been quite, um, quite dramatic, I guess, uh, to a very public, prominent role, which you didn't go looking for back in the day. Um, just talk us perhaps through, for those that aren't so familiar with some of the things you've been involved with, some of the roles you've played um, within the House of Lords and within government. Um, and I guess how that looks today, because it, under lockdown, it's very different for you than, than it would normally be. Well, I'm very old. I mean, I've had a lot of decades in which to uh, practice and um, develop. And in the early days, uh, it was way back in the 1980s, and Poland was going through the terrible days of martial law, the Iron Curtain and so on. So I did work with Medical Aid for Poland Fund, taking in medical supplies into Poland in those dark days and always came back humbled and inspired by the courage and the dignity, the generosity, the graciousness and the humour in courage of the mm. Polish people. So when I mean, that burst out of the Iron Curtain, then did quite a lot of work in Russia with orphaned and abandoned children. And he always worked with local partners. As I said earlier, they're the real heroes and heroines. And that's, we could talk all the time about that, but that was turned out to be a very successful enterprise uh, thanks to our partners. And then. Uh, it opened up gradually more and more, uh, originally in those days of Christian Solidarity International, and then also Christian Solidarity Worldwide, CSI, is Switzerland-based, Christian Solidarity Worldwide is UK-based. And we did a lot of work um, redeeming slaves in South Sudan, in the little Armenian enclave in the Gona Karabakh, and so on. So it evolved. And then, because CSW uh, focused on advocacy, which is important, and I have a great respect for Mervyn Thomas, their founder in the, this country and so on, great guy. But it was advocacy. And I just felt, maybe it's the nurse in me, but if we were with people dying of starvation in the jungles of Burma, to say I'll be a voice for you, uh, didn't necessarily meet all their needs. So I found it hard to provide both aid and advocacy uh, to these victims of oppression and persecution. And that's taken us as heart has developed in South Sudan, Sudan, 
um, the little Armenian enclave of Nagorno Karabakh, um, which is starting located in Azerbaijan, is at the moment under huge risk. Uh, but also Burma, who worked with the Karen and the Kareni and the Chin people. And then um, Timor Leste, we worked with the Childhood Malnutrition Program, been very successful. We just withdrawing from there because it's sustainable and taken off. We also worked in um, Uganda, northern Uganda, when the notorious Lord of Resistance Army was active out there. And we met a lot of um, all the kids who had been forced to become child soldiers. And we're now working also in Syria. So, uh, yeah. Ranger country, we're very small, it's only five percent hard. But yes. we give all we can in the way of prayer and aid and support to these wonderful partners. And so the, the voice within uh, the Lords really enables you to be asking question, questions and challenging government ministers, you know, what are they doing? What part are we playing in, in those parts of the world? Is that, is that how those two things dovetail, really? Yes, I'm, I'm told by members of the House of Lords that when I speak, the House does listen because they know I've been there. I'm not yeah. just reading uh, someone else's report, but I've actually been there, met the people, witnessed the evidence at first hand. And so that's a very powerful um, as well, addition to the role I can play in the House of Lords in advocacy and being a voice for those who don't have a voice. Yeah, I mean, as well as that, you've been involved in some fairly key debates and um, pieces of legislation here in the UK as well um, over the years. Mm -hmm. well, the current Tell us a little bit about that as well. Well, the current one, which has taken up a lot of time, because I think it is so important, is for Muslim women in this country are suffering from Sharia law. Um, for people who don't know about Sharia law, if it can be applied in such a way that if you don't have a legally registered marriage, most Muslim women don't, then the man can just divorce you by saying, I divorced you three times, and they are divorced. They don't have any uh, comparable right or reciprocity. And one lady, they come to me in tears, they can be suicidal. And yeah. one lady described her achievement of a divorce through the post. And they're left destitute, desolate, and often uh, shunned by the community. And mm. they do not happen in this country. They have, they have no rights if they have a Sharia law divorce and no registered marriage. And so we're trying to get through legislation to make sure that all religious marriages are legally registered, and that would give them the civil protection they need. But it's a big battle. And I'm sure. Government vitally vitally important, and, and I guess quite compelling that as a, a Christian, you're actually standing up for the rights of those from another um, of the great world religions. Um, well, the biblical mandate, of course, is heal the sick, feed the hungry, uh, clothe the naked, speak for the oppressed. It doesn't say Christians. Yeah. Absolutely so right. Yeah. Available yeah. for with unconditional love. Yeah. We've just spent some time as a church thinking about um, the doctrine of humanity, what it means to be human, and uh, particularly that idea of everybody having that dignity and that value and that worth because they're created in the image of God is, is a huge part of what it means yep. us as a church to, to live that out locally as well. So um, that's really lovely to hear and, and encouraging to hear that that's happening um, in other places too. It needs a lot of prayer because at the moment the government is just not being at all productive. Right. So it's a cultural issue, it's a social issue. Well, yeah. I'm sorry, it's a legal issue. You've mentioned a couple of times um, HEART, uh, which is the Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust. And I know from just watching one or two other interviews where you've spoken about it, that really being a Baroness and being part of the House of Lords is, is, is really important to you. But the work that you do at HEART really, uh, really kind of gets you out of bed in the morning. Um, just tell us a little bit about HEART uh, to begin with, how that came about and what shape your work is taking with them at the moment, before we perhaps go on to talk about some of the key areas around the world at the moment that you're involved with in a bit more detail? Well, as I indicated earlier, I found it a heart um, to provide aid and advocacy for people who are off the radar screen of the major aid organisations whose voices are not heard. And that's why we sometimes have to cross it legally, because we go, other people don't go. And as if you combine with aid, and we always believe, we work with local partners, and they're the real heroes and heroines. And we always believe in giving them the dignity of choice to say, what is your priority? And, and 
may or may not be what we would expect. Very often it's quite surprising what their priority is, but they know their communities, they know their needs. And so um, we give them a dignity of choice and then we work with the local partners, we don't manage them. They are incredibly resourceful, resilient people. A picture of agents of people sitting there with their hands up is not how it is. These are people who are not going to die or let their own people die easily. They'll do everything they can to help their people. And so the, you know, the multiplier effect, the, the incredible uh, results we get. And I was saying the seeds, it's like an amazing harvest for mm. each and every one of our partners. They're wonderful people. Yep. And then as if we try to provide them with some aid and they multiply that and we try to be their voice. And very often we are probably the only people speaking for them. Yeah. And very often, for example, in Burma at the moment, we say Burma, not Myanmar, because local people prefer that. But in Burma, we hear a lot about the Rohingya and they are suffering. They don't belittle their suffering at all. But um, we don't hear about the Shan. And the Shan, they're Buddhists, and they are suffering horrendous attacks by the Burmese army, forced displacement across the border. And it's very similar to Rohingya. And you don't hear about them at all. A lot of the aid organizations have moved from eastern Burma and Shan status round to the Rohingya. And so we are a voice for the Shan people. They're Buddhist, but they need a voice. Yes. And we are there for them uh, with unconditional aid and advocacy. So that's really why Heart was founded. And above all, it depends on that fundamental principle of genuinely working with and for local partners. Not mm -hmm. managing announcing what we're going to do again and build a clinic, we're going to build something, uh, they may not want that. No. And the no. dignity of choice, celebrating their achievements, and that's the basis for sustainability. Right. Um, you've mentioned their Burma. Um, other particular flashpoints around the globe at the moment? I mean, I guess as we start this conversation, this part of the conversation, you could end up talking all night about different situations and circumstances, but where where are you particularly seeing need at the moment and where are you particularly involved with at the moment? Uh, yeah. Well, to me, the major uh, crises, um, one is Nigeria. Um, the British government does not take seriously the incredible scale of massacres and killings, especially of Christians. We heard about Boko Haram and what they do is dreadful, yeah. but um, you don't hear about the Islamist Fulani who are um, sort of traditional herdsmen, and they drive their huge uh, herds of cattle across the land. And it's always done that for millennia. And it always causes a bit of tension because nobody really likes lots of cattle munching your harvest, but they move on. And now it's very different. They have been Islamized in the Islamist uh, tradition, um, and they uh, are well armed. They are not all of them, but the ones who are carrying out the terrorist attacks. And they've murdered about 5,000 Christians in the last five years. We don't hear about it. Um, they've destroyed at least 500 churches, possibly more. Uh, they kidnapped into one of the worst things and have a lot of hostages and uh, kidnapped victims. And uh, you may or may not remember the Chibok girls and mm. this gay girl from the Chibok girls near Sharibu. And she mm. refused to convert to Islam. She just broke her along, and um, so she'd been kept in perpetuity as a slave, and I think she'd probably you know, been raped and um, had a horrendous time. Um, her mother, Rebecca Sharibu, was over in the country trying to make a case. And you know, her daughter's now been uh, in that kind of awful situation of being a hostage for over two years now, which is yes. sheer. Um, but that has been a huge scare. You don't hear about it. The British government just calls it tit for tat between farmers and traders. But yeah. one of the worst things are the atrocities they perpetrate. The atrocities right. is just one example, and it's not a happy example, but it's how it is for the people. Last time I was there, um, I met a lady who, uh, when the Fulani surrounded her village, she tried to run, but she got surrounded by Fulani with her little six-year-old daughter. They slashed her with a machete or sort of scars, and then they said, your little girl would like to suck her mother's finger. They cut off her finger, she passed out. When she woke up, her little girl, age six, was dead with mother's finger sticking in her mouth. Now, I'm afraid I could repeat a, a horrendous number of similar. I met a lady who left arm being amputated 
when she put her hand up to protect her face and the machete, they cut off all her fingers, she's all her fingers falling in front of them. And so she has no, no hands she can work with. She's got one arm is amputated, the other has no hand with her, no fingers. I mean, they are atrocities. And there's no way you can explain those in the way that our government explains them as being climate change, uh, desertification, land problems. They're obviously factors, but they don't explain that degree no. of terrorism. No. So whilst, of course, there are those complex underlying factors, there are, there are other things going on as well. It's yeah. like on the Rakhba book with the attack, etc. And Boko Haram said it wanted to get all Christians out of northern Nigeria. And they're quite explicit about right. uh, their agenda. So that's one prayer. And just briefly, insofar as that links in Parliament, I happen to be appointed chair of the all-party parliamentary group on freedom of religion and belief. And they were just bringing out a report on Nigeria, which I saw, and it was very much our government's position report, that it's you know, tit for tat, instant climate change, etc. But we actually were able to uh, add a lot of the truth to it. And it now contains a lot of the evidence, a lot of the tragic facts of what is actually going on in Central Belt Nigeria today. Happy to make it available for anyone who would like to see it. Right. Lovely, thank you. We can get hold of that for anybody uh, after this. Um, You've mentioned Nigeria. Um, I know other, you, you mentioned Burma. Uh, you're particularly involved, or have been particularly involved in South Sudan as well. Um, at the moment, a priority has very tragically in the last few days come up to the top of the uh, need list because they've done a lot of work in Armenia and the little bit of ancient Armenia that Stalin cut off but with his tsunami yeah. outside Azerbaijan. Well, tell us a, a bit about that. If that's a sort of current, very current priority, let's. let's as of now, uh, yeah. the main war when Azerbaijan wanted to carry ethnic cleansing of the Armenians was from about 1990 to 94. Now, I've been there 84 times. A lot of those. Oh, you said, sorry, you said that again. You've been there? Four times. Yeah, many, many during the war. Yeah. And you had 400 grad missiles a day pounding in on the middle capital city and so on. It was the most high intensity conflict in the 90s. It was hell on earth. But eventually a ceasefire was signed. But in the last few days, and Azerbaijan has been building up the military, uh, all sorts of military forces along the border with Armenia. It's fired across that border. It's fired at from villages, innocent civilian villages. It, this morning, I'm told it fired at a kindergarten in Armenia. And so I'm told, I've got to check it up because I haven't read the details yet, but it came through on the phone to me that today the Armenian think foreign minister or minister of defense, but yeah, one of the Armenian government officials said that they are going to attack Armenia, they're going to blow up Armenia's nuclear power station, and uh, well, they're going to take Armenia. So right. that, yeah, that's as of today. And right. there are tremendous riots in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, demanding uh, that they take Armenia. And um, part of that may be explained as a diversion because the public are very angry the way the Azerbaijan government has not dealt well with the coronavirus. So it may be a deflection um, right. onto, onto, in, from an inner problem, but it's very serious. So we just need everybody's prayer, please. Yeah. So we're praying about uh, the situation in Nigeria at the moment and particularly praying for peace in Azerbaijan and Armenia, where that border is, and that enclave there, Nagorno-Karabakh. I know you've been involved there for a long time, and, yeah. and, and that's bound up. The because they they tried. They started a war in Nagorno-Karabakh. I think it was 1916. Anyhow, in the last few years, and that was a four-day intense uh, military aggression against the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. And they showed the heartbreaking things went out on social media, and Azerbaijan soldier holding a young Armenian soldier's head in his hand and you know tragic heartbreaking situations. So please yeah. add Armenia and Nagorno Karabakh to your prayer list. Thank you. Yeah we will we will do that. Um, obviously you, you have high points, you have low points. Um, it sounds like this is a particularly difficult situation. Um, but you've got lots of stories of Courage. Um, interesting that you, you shared with us that verse from Daniel, uh, from uh, Joshua at the beginning, and uh, how, you know, encouraging God's people to have courage in the face of unknown uh, and overwhelming odds. Um, and it seems you've lived your life by that 
particular verse, but perhaps some stories there. You did share one story of a uh, situation where you were told not to go somewhere. I guess, I guess you don't take kindly to being told not to go somewhere. No, I think that was probably Syria. Um, we, Syria's recently come onto our agenda because the needs are huge. And I, I was a complete political ignoramus on Syria. Before I went the first time was in 2016, when the fighting was still going on up in Aleppo and so on and, and elsewhere. And before I went, I was invited by an, an Anglican vicar and he was a pastor, was it? Was Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, who is one of the great experts on interfaith relations and so on. And, um, and you know, I did let the government know, rather regret it, I did, because I had a required phone call with a minister. And luckily, I belong to a political party. I'm independent. I think they'll just if I belong to a political party. And yeah, I had a required phone call with the minister. And he shouted on the phone at me and said, You cannot go to Syria. And I said, Well, why not, minister? It's not safe. It's dangerous, there's no, there's no um, embassy there. If you get into trouble, there's no one to help you. It's dangerous. So I said, well, thank you, Minister. But earlier this year, I was in the Nuba Mountains in Sudan, where the air aircraft bombers from Khartoum were bombing their people. People had fled up into the caves at the top of the mountains with deadly snakes to hide from the bombardment. I was with them in the caves of the deadly snakes. So I used my role in the House of Lords, Minister. She was, wasn't going to get very far with that one. So he shut up on that one. And he turned tack and he said, well, you ruined British foreign policy. So I'm, I said, I'm the new kid on the block. I have no idea what British foreign policy is. And it's a pastoral visit, not a political visit. He said, you've got to read the Foreign Office papers. So they were sent round to me and I had to read them. And um, I, I was literally totally naive. I mean, even working in Sudan and Nigeria and Burma, you know, I hadn't followed what's going on in Syria. And then, you know, every page said forced regime change, forced regime change. Now, President Assad has done some things that you cannot condone. Um, you know, it's not a good track record in many ways. Mm. But when we had our meeting before we went, and Bishop Michael Nasrali, who's the expert, we discussed if we invited to meet Assad, what would we do? He just said, well, of course, he's not the worst monster in the region. And he isn't. If you compare him with the terrible um, human rights and well, massacres and almost genocide carried out by President al-Bashir in Sudan, who's recently been removed, but was there since 89, he was responsible for the murder of three million people, displacement of five million, hundreds of thousands million children taken into slavery. I mean, on a different scale. And similarly, um, oh, what's the name of the country? Um, Saudi Arabia. You know, it doesn't have a very good track record, but we have a love affair with Saudi Arabia. So there's real double standards there. Anyway, we went and we met people we did meet the president and got a lot of stick for it from the British media. But we met you know, the whole spectrum of people, from local people in villages through to opposition politi politicians, through to um, artists and writers. And we went up to Aleppo when the battle from Eastern Aleppo was still going on. And the bombs were falling all the time. And we met the Society of Doctors up there and everybody, everybody supported Assad. Because anybody said, right, there's lesser of two evils. Do you want Assad, who's actually very good on rights for women. Women really appreciate that, especially in that part of the world. And he's very good on the rights of minorities, well, he is one. Um, but he's not all bad. And the same people we met, so we used to be strong opponents of Assad. And one of them, a Christian leader in Malula, said, now I would die for him. He is their, their safety guard, their safety net against the horrendous jihadists. And so when we were up in Aleppo, Western Aleppo and the bombs were coming in from Eastern Aleppo all the time. I should never forget, we were hosted by the Armenian community there, but they invited everyone. They invited the Muftis, uh, they invited all, all the different Islamic leaders, the different Christian traditions, the Yazidis, at a wonderful sort of open air banquet the night we arrived. It seemed there was hardly any food, it must have been very costly for them. And the mm -hmm. bombs were coming in all the time, near 350 meters, the hardest front line. And um, they had a band playing music. The music plays while the bombs fall. It's Armenia for you. And the next day we had a service in the Armenian church. And again, everyone was there. The Islamic leaders were in the front rows and the Yazidis were there and the other different traditions. And after that, I'll never forget, the Chaldean Catholic priest came up and he said, thank you so much for coming. Then he referred to the story of Thomas, so-called Doubting Thomas, who, as you all remember, uh, when our Lord appeared to the other disciples, he wouldn't believe it. I'm not going to believe unless Jesus appears to me and I put my hand into his wounded hands and sides. So 
Jesus did appear to him and said, put your hands in my wounded hands inside. Now you go and believe. And it's lovely, Gaudin Catholic, he said, thank you so much for coming. Like Thomas the Apostle, you came, you put your hands into the wounds of our suffering. Now you believe, go and tell. What an image. You put yourself yes. into the wounds of our suffering. What a privilege. Yeah. Oh, what a privilege. What a privilege. Yeah. What a privilege. And so would you describe yourself as a naturally courageous person? I mean, is that why your, uh, your vicar gave you that? particular verse when you were confirmed? I'm, no, I don't think I'm a naturally courageous person at all. I'm basically, I said, God shows the weak and the foolish, he finds the right number in me. Um, I'm basically shy. I've managed to hide it most of the time because the passion comes through. But yes. also I don't like politics and I'm not a politician. And yes, I do get very scared. And I remember once before going out to Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh at the height of that war, we used to fly in helicopters under fire and on the Saturday afternoon, I had my fit of what I call faithless, fearful dread. And I really did not want to go. I was terrified. You don't share it. And the kids were still around and so on. So you keep it to yourself. The next morning, I went to church and the gospel was, he who's not prepared to leave husband, wife, brothers, sisters for my sake, is not worthy to be my disciple. I think that's a bit after it. But he who does will find new brothers and sisters, even under persecution. And we've met the most wonderful heroes and heroines of faith. We always come back receiving more than they ever, ever give. And we're just so blessed by their partnership with us and by the way they hold their front lines of faith and freedom in ways that make me feel very humble. So afraid, yes. But I have something to say to students you know, wondering what to do with their lives. One of the things you have to do is be prepared to cross your frontiers of fear. Now, they don't have to be going to Armenia in a battle situation. There are different kinds of frontiers of fear. Maybe going to uni for the first time. There are all sorts of things which are challenging. But if you feel God's calling you there, if there's a door that God opened in front of you and you didn't open it yourself, you feel it's calling you there, you've got to cross that frontier of fear. If you do, new horizons open up. You meet new people and new brothers and sisters and uh, you know, your life will evolve and grow according to God. Mm. But yes, one is. Yeah. But you draw that courage from, uh, from God and, and uh, the fact that you feel very much that he's called you and um, set you apart to do this particular role for him. Well, I just feel that um, well, if God calls one, if you really feel that, you have to be yeah. prepared to go and say, yes. cross the fear. And I always love that cliche. I think it's a very profound cliche. God doesn't want our ability, he wants our availability. Our ability is a little thing. Our availability, if we are available for God, he'll give us the ability to do what he wants us to do. Yeah. And what a privilege that is. Yeah, that's lovely. And so just as we wrap, wrap up and, and draw to a close, I, I, I could sit here listening to you and, and chatting to you all, all night. It's, uh, it's fascinating. And maybe I hope we might get the opportunity again, maybe in person um, nope. in the future. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. But um, so many needs around the world. A um, couple, of, couple of points really is, is, firstly, how do you pick any? How do you pick one from the, from the many? And, you know, we're not all called to be sitting in the House of Lords, to be dukes and baronesses and, and the like. And we don't all have perhaps that public platform in the same way you do. So I suppose there's two things. How do we choose and where do we start for, for, for somebody like, you know, us in in little old Bedford? Well, I think, first of all, is um, the, the first part of your question. Uh, how do you choose or what do you choose? I think, as far as I'm concerned, it was that call uh, to be a voice for those who don't have a voice. And that seemed to be a truly Christian calling. And going to the House of Lords was God's extraordinary idea uh, to give me a place where I can have that great privilege of being a voice for these wonderful heroes and heroines. How one chooses, I think one looks at one's, the basic calling in your life, which God seems to be giving you, we've all got different vocations. And then I think it's just making those decisions that are in accord with that basic, basic calling. And obviously you don't have to be in the House of Lords for that. You can be called to do all sorts of things. Um, but I think one's open and obedient to God's calling, then as I said, he'll give the availability 
and the blessing to do what he wants done. And that may be working with the homeless and the lonely. It may be visiting a hospice down the road. It doesn't have to be in the remote areas that I find myself. Yeah. God's calling us to love wherever we are. And to, uh, he'll help us to make the choice he wants us to make. Mm, that's lovely. You have a sort of motto, don't you, that you, you speak often, uh, you share with people. Do you want to just share that with us as we, as we uh, again, draw to a close? It's one you're thinking of and I'm thinking of. It's our motto in heart, because heart city is very small. We're working in all these countries. And um, it, sometimes people feel overwhelmed by the enormity of demands, needs, and so on. But you could feel just you know, like giving up uh, because it's too much. And so our little motto in heart is, I cannot do everything, but I must not do nothing. And if together we all do something, we can have that privilege of making a difference. And I always say, and you can always pray, and then God will show us what he wants us to do in our lives. Make sense? Absolutely. Cannot do everything, but I must not do nothing. Got to do something. Yeah, yeah. Start with the one in front of you who God is, where God has placed you. And right. let's see where God takes us all as we, as we seek to do that. Well, Lady Cox, Caroline, it's been a real joy uh, hearing from you and chatting to you. Um, can I pray for you um, before we pray down on the Zoom meeting and, uh, and uh, allow you to go back to your international uh, affairs that you're dealing with and uh, pray for you now. And, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord our God, we are so grateful for this uh, short time uh, together with uh, Lady Cox and we thank you uh, for all that she's been able to share with us. We thank you first and foremost, for calling her uh, into your family, for making her uh, a daughter of the King. Uh, we thank you that for decades now, she has faithfully served you, uh, just trying to do that one thing to the person that you, you place in front of her. We thank you for that varied and uh, very um, mixed experience that she has enjoyed in different walks of life that have uniquely um, equipped and enabled her to do the task to which you've called her now. We thank you for the public voice that she has, for the opportunity she has to uh, speak up for those who don't have a voice, to advocate for those who are not heard around the world. And we pray that, that voice would be heard loud and clear by those who are in positions of authority and who are able to shape legislation and policy uh, to aid and support those who are the least and the lowest uh, in the world that you have made. Father, we thank you that under all, all of this, uh, underpinning all of this, is that uh, belief that all are created uh, by you, all are created equal, all have dignity and value and worth. And we do pray that you would enable us all in the situation you've placed us to do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith, but to do good to all. And that we would take uh, on board those words that the, the, the prophet from old spoke, Micah, who tells us to, that we know what God requires of us. He knows what uh, we know what uh, you've shown us and what is good, that we are to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with you, our God. So we pray for Caroline in those very real flashpoints in Burma, in Nigeria, and particularly currently in Armenia and Azerbaijan. We ask that her voice would be heard and we pray that you by your spirit would overrule in all these situations and bring peace and bring reconciliation and that you would bring many, many people to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ through the work of your people on the ground in those nations. Father, these things are way beyond us. They're, they're so much bigger uh, than us, but we thank you that we bring them and lay them at the throne of heaven and plead with you uh, to intervene. Hear us and go with us from now, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for a wonderful prayer. Hi, I'm Caroline. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, we wish you well in, in all that you do and we'll be keeping an eye on, uh, on the news and the, the parliamentary reports and things like that and, and uh, praying for you uh, because it's a significant work you're doing and uh, we pray God's blessing on you. Much appreciated and much needed and I'll send you a copy of the Nigeria report if you like that came Thank out you. in the public domain. It's from your party parliamentary group and if you have other things to pray about for Nigeria. And uh, lovely to keep in touch and can't thank you enough for the privilege of sharing the pain and the passion. Well, it's moving, isn't it?
and really challenging to hear some of those things. Caroline mentioned some horrific, uh, frightening situations around the world, things that really fly under our radar that we're unaware of. I've spent a bit of time trying to track down some of the news from Azerbaijan and Armenia and, and looking into the details of what's happened in Nigeria. And it is truly, truly horrific. And it can be hard to know how to respond. But as children of the King, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, we have access to the highest court in the universe. And we can speak up for these oppressed peoples at the very throne of heaven. That's what Michael and Mo and Louise and Nick are going to do for us now. We would like to pray for Armenia, Azerbaijan and Nigeria. Father, we thank you for all the wonderful things you have done. We commit the areas of Nagoro Karabakh onto your hand. Lord, we ask that you touch the hearts of men who are hungry for blood, who are hungry for life. So Lord, that you touch their hearts and let them have everything. We ask that there be peace in this land. We ask everlasting Father that you touch the hearts of the Azerbaijans, that their agenda, that evil, the evil agenda they may have, that Lord, they may have everything. Father, Lord, let peace reign. And we also pray for the families of the loved ones that have already been killed. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that you comfort them in this period. In Jesus' name. Father, Lord, we pray for Nigeria as a nation. We pray for a good government. Lord God, we commit the northern part of Nigeria into your hands and we ask for peace to reign. Father, Lord, we pray that the killing of innocent Christians stop. We've just seen five aid workers being killed in Nigeria. Father, Lord, we ask that you comfort their families during this trying period in Jesus' name. Lord God Almighty, we ask that the Nigerian government will rise up to protect communities and bring the, the doers to justice in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, we pray for peace to reign in Nigeria. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Hi, I've been asked to pray uh, in the light of some of the issues raised this evening with a particular focus on Southeast Asia. So I want to pray for Baroness Cox. I want to pray for those people in that particular area of the world. Um, and I want to pray for ourselves and how we respond to these issues. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, the testimony that we've heard this evening from Baroness Cox, the work that she's been involved in. We thank you for her. We thank you for that work and those organisations that she represents. We pray that you will strengthen that work and that it will be successful in terms of relieving um, the suffering and inhumanity which is occurs throughout this broken and troubled world. Um, I pray especially for the people living in Southeast Asia and most particularly in uh, Myanmar, which we've heard of again this evening. Uh, you know we are heartbroken when we think of some of those people, some of those tribes that we've heard mentioned again, the Karen and the uh, Chin uh, tribes we think of, um, where there's been great persecution for many years. And um, we also uh, pray for the Rohingya peoples. Um, and we think of the um, not only the, the the Christians suffering in Myanmar, but we think of the uh, Muslims, the Buddhist tribes, uh, people who are at the hand of those wicked oppressors. And we pray for them. We pray again for the work that is going on throughout Myanmar. We thank you for encouraging news from neighbouring Laos. Just a, a few days ago, we heard that there had been relaxation in the some of the restrictions, uh, particularly for uh, Christians in Laos. And we do thank you for that, Father. We pray that that will continue. And again, that that will spread throughout other countries in Southeast Asia. So we bring these people to you, Father. We love them. Uh, we thank you for them. We thank you for their faithful witness to you in the areas in which they live. And we do pray for them and commit them to you and pray that you will relieve their suffering and oppression. And then lastly, I just want to pray for ourselves and uh, help us to consider carefully 
what our response should be to what we've heard this evening. We pray that you will touch our hearts, that you will change our thoughts, perhaps, our attitude towards others. Keep us from our own form of tribalism and racism and pray that you will um, help us both here on our own doorstep in our own neighbourhood, uh, but throughout the world, as we've heard this evening, we pray that we, quite simply, that we will act justly, uh, love mercy and walk humbly before you, our God. We ask all these things in your name and in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his sake. Amen. Heavenly Father, our hearts break as we take in all the things that Caroline has spoken of today. But we know that this is just a very small picture of the injustice in our world. We particularly want to come now and pray for those within our country and even our own locality who are suffering at the hands of others. We pray for those who have arrived in our country under false pretenses with the promise of a better life, only to find the reality very different. Lord, we plead on their behalf that they could be released from their enslavement, ill treatment and hopelessness. Lord, this situation seems almost impossible to us, but you have promised to bring comfort to the helpless and freedom to the captives. So please, in your mercy, would you set them free? Would you please also speak into the hearts and minds of the perpetrators that they might have their eyes open to their evil deeds and be stopped in their tracks? We praise and thank you for organisations such as Hope for Justice who are seeking to be a voice for the oppressed and bring justice for them. Thank you for their gifts and passion in this work. And Lord, we particularly want to lift to you the women who are victims of the Sharia law marriages, who've been divorced by their husbands and are consequently left desolate and alone, having been shunned by their communities. Lord, would you bring those into their paths that would point them to yourself, where they could find light in the midst of darkness. We pray too for our government, that they would see and understand their plight and be drawn to make changes for their protection. And Lord, as we ourselves have been called to heal the sick, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and speak for the oppressed, I pray for myself and all my brothers and sisters that they will be, we will be able to play a part in this day by day. May our eyes and hearts be open to reach out to those in need, whatever those needs may be. Lord, please would you intervene and hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, thank you so much again for your company this evening. I hope you found that helpful and stimulating. And do come back to us if you've got any questions or would like to know any more. We've got some of those reports that Caroline mentioned that we could send you uh, for you to read through. Don't forget next week again uh, on YouTube at 10.30 and 6 o'clock. Our two services then will premiere. We look forward to uh, joining with you then. And if there are issues in your life at the moment, uh, joys or sorrows, things where you feel you just need that support or somebody to pray with you, uh, please do get in touch. We have a dedicated email address, prayerteam at graceinthecommunity.com and they stand by all week ready to pray with you uh, if that would be helpful to you. Let me close with a word of prayer from scripture and uh, this is uh, from the letter to the, to the Ephesians which says this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, may God bless you and be with you this week. <laughs>